So why don't we start the night with a quick Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. to week six of Love and Responsibility. How great it is to see all of you here again. Can I get a show of hands? Um, how many people came last week? Okay. How many people have been here all six weeks? Way to go. Small but mighty. How many people, this is your first time attending this series, this Love and Responsibility series? Welcome. Welcome. We're so happy to have you. We're happy to have everyone here. Um, I just want to say a couple quick words, a couple quick announcements, and then we'll get the show on the road. Um, of course, before we get started, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has made this possible, to the seminary for letting us use this beautiful space, to the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, now the Youth Office of Youth and Young Adults that is now called Anthem, if you haven't seen their emails yet, they're newly branded. Um, to CCYA for sponsoring the bar tonight. Um, to McShays, who generously sponsored all that amazing food. I hope that everyone plans to go to McShays after this with us tonight and patronize their wonderful establishment. Uh, I heard they might be getting a van, so it's worth going. Um, also for the Theology of the Body Institute, if you haven't visited their table, they're giving away free books if you just sign up with them, which is totally worth it. Um, so we just have had so many people. We have a special sponsor for tonight that make this whole night possible. Um, we have just been so blessed. It is all gift that we're here. Um, and actually, quick funny story. We, at least at the Culture Project, and I know we're not the only ones because I spoke to Christopher before this, but we have had quite a day making this happen, this event happen. Everything from, we didn't think we were going to have any chairs, um, to a flight that only just got in because it was delayed five hours, and to like the rains, to everything. It's just been crazy. So we, we have a feeling that that the Lord might have big plans tonight for us in this room. And, and so we're happy. This is success. Every little success should be celebrated. And that we all made it here. And it's no longer raining. So praise God. Come on, Spirit. We'll see what happens. Um, the schedule for tonight is going to be a little different than it usually is. Um, try not to be too sad. Uh, but we're not going to do any reading beforehand. So really sorry about that. Um, but I, I think we'll make up for it in the course of the night. We will be breaking up into small groups after after we hear from Christopher. But but hold, so you will get your time to chat and catch up. Um, just so everyone knows, in case you don't, the bathrooms are through this door over here. Um, we're not using this door to go out or in during the entirety of the night. Um, I think that's all the announcements that I have. So before we uh, get started, I want to invite up my wonderful boss and leader and big sister and friend and mentor, uh, Christina Barba, who is going to uh, introduce our speaker. Good evening, everyone. Don't worry, I am not going to be speaking again tonight. Those of you that had to sit through me last week, you are in for quite a treat. I echo what Katie said, as I was sitting on the runway for hours and hours today in Detroit, I was thinking, this event tonight is going to be awesome. So uh, I am so delighted and honored to get to be here tonight with all of you to listen to one of my heroes uh, present. And not only do I get to listen and soak this all in, but I get to introduce Christopher. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of a more of a formal bio and then share a few remarks of my own. So, those of you that don't know, our speaker is the wonderful Christopher West. 
He is a proud husband and father of five. His global lecturing, best-selling books, and multiple audio and video programs have made him the world's most recognized teacher of John Paul II's Theology of the Body, a bold biblical vision of love and sexuality that takes us to the core of what it means to be human. As the founder and president of the CORE Project, Christopher leads an international outreach devoted to spreading this liberating teaching and empowering others to learn, live, and share it. His work has been featured in the New York Times, on ABC News, Fox News, MSNBC, and countless Catholic and evangelical media outlets. Beyond his work as a popularized Theology of the Body speaker, Christopher has been teaching graduate and undergraduate courses on this, on this subject since the late 1990s, having served on the faculties of St. John Vianney Theological Seminary in Denver, the Institute of Priestly Formation in Omaha, and as a visiting professor at the John Paul II Institute in Melbourne, Australia. In 2004, he helped establish the Theology of the Body Institute, which we all know right around here. And he serves today as a senior lecturer of theology and Christian anthropology. His week-long courses there continue to draw students from around the world. Among Christopher's best-selling books are Theology of the Body for Beginners, The Good News About Sex and Marriage, At the Heart of the Gospel, Fill These Hearts, and Pope Francis to Go, Bite-Sized Morsels from the Joy of the Gospel. His latest release is a free ebook, Theology of the Body, at the movies, which can be downloaded at thecoreproject.com slash backslash movies. You can stay in touch with Christopher at coreproject.com and by following Christopher West, C. West Official, on Facebook and Twitter at C. West TOV and on his new YouTube channel, The Core Project. You can also learn more about becoming a core member and the many ex exclusive benefits that you receive at coremembership.com. Also, if you haven't noticed, there's an awesome, um, there are awesome tables um, out in the front and you can get lots more information about all of this stuff and some of Christopher's books themselves. So, one of the reasons why I am so delighted and honored to present and to introduce Christopher to all of you tonight is because some years back, just a couple years back, uh, when I was at my uh, college days at Penn State University, I first stumbled upon this CD series in this like white box, and it had all of these CDs in these like little white envelopes, and it was entitled Naked Without Shame. And up until this point, I had, I had like a decent understanding um, of the church's beautiful teachings on sexuality, and I totally got that living according to the church's teachings was a freeing and joyful way to live. I had already been sold on that. But it wasn't until I encountered the theology of the body that I understood for the first time, like, the bigger why, the big why behind these beautiful teachings, more about who I am, what it means to be a woman, what does it mean to be human. And these beautiful words of John Paul II first came to me through the voice of Christopher West on these little CDs. So, I got my hands on those, I devoured them, I spread them to all of my friends, and then, well, the rest is history. Um, these topics have changed my life, and Christopher, I am so grateful to Christopher for answering the Lord's call, for saying yes to really receiving this gift. I really believe Christopher has an anointing, a special anointing, a charism, for sharing the theology of the body in a simple, coherent way to everyone out there without watering it down. So it is a great joy to present the one and only Christopher West. I hope you enjoy this evening, and uh, let's pray for this night. Thank you. Sorry, Christopher, there's a tan sedan in front of the fire hydrant. Oh, shoot. That's fire mine. zone. That's mine. Sorry. Is it really? We can move it. Oh. Just kidding. If anyone can move their tan sedan, that would be awesome. Tan sedan in front of the fire hydrant. So you guys have 
This is the tail end of a series we've been doing on love and responsibility. Before I just jump in with my topic tonight, which is theology of the body, a later work of John Paul II, would you be willing to share with me some of what you've been learning? So I, I don't feel like I'm just coming in here cold. What has this series meant to anybody if you've been to at least one or two or three or six of them? Anybody? What are you learning? What are you learning about love? What are you learning about life? What aha moments have you had? Anybody willing to share that? Yes, back here. What's your name? Uh, Sean. Sean, tell me an aha moment or something you've learned. Well, I think one of the biggest stand moments in the whole series for me was uh, actually uh, last week when uh, we brought to my attention that uh, men have a responsibility to be um, modest as well. In, uh, you know, normally you think about women have to you know, dress modestly or to cover being modest, and that was all I had ever really given thought uh, to that topic at all. But men, as far as being emotionally, if you're not involved with women that they're not supposed to be involved with emotionally, it's sort of like the counterpart to that. That was something new for So modesty, if I can summarize, modesty is more than just the clothing you wear or don't wear, right? Modesty has to do with an inner sense of our dignity as men and women and wanting to protect that dignity from degradation. So we're going to learn here tonight about nakedness without shame, just to give you a little preview of where we're headed. We do not cover our bodies in this fallen world because our bodies are bad. Your bodies are not bad. My body's not bad. That's a heresy called Manichaeism. Uh, well, we're having a little feedback here. If you can uh, deal with that. Thank you. So we cover our bodies because our bodies are so good. And we feel an instinctive need, or should feel an instinctive need, to protect the goodness of our bodies from anything that would degrade it. So we'll unfold that more. But it's very, very important. We don't cover our bodies because they're bad. There's a heresy. Anybody else have an aha moment in this series you want to share? I hope you will miss. I was going to say, like, we should treat uh, every person we encounter with a brother and sister in Christ. Okay, treat every person we encounter as a brother or sister. What does that mean? Hold it with, like, higher standards. Like, you know, what I mean? Okay, so higher standards, but what does that mean? What are the higher standards? And why should we have high standards? And what are standards anyway? I want to have fun in life. I don't know about you. I want to have fun, and I hear standards, and I go, no, 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 no. Is living the Christian life just a bunch of rules we're supposed to follow? Why is Christianity often reduced to a list of rules to follow? CCD. CCD. All right. <laughs> From a movie that came out in the 80s. It's called Heaven Help Us. You can cue it up. Heaven Help Us. This is a caricature of Catholic schools when it comes to sex. So, as a caricature, it's an exaggeration, but I think a lot of us might be able to relate to some of this exaggeration. Let's take a look. Now, let me introduce to you, Father Ruzzi. We'll be giving the first talk. Thanks. Father? Certain feelings. 
feelings which you might be inclined to confuse with love. But ladies and gentlemen, never confuse love with the deadliest of the seven deadly sins. Something infinite. 
But when we're raised on the starvation diet gospel, and it basically goes like this, your desires are bad, they're only going to get you in trouble, you need to repress all that, but follow all these rules and you'll be a good upstanding Christian citizen. Sound familiar to anybody? It's kind of the message in the air oftentimes, right? Growing up in Catholic schools, growing up in the church, this can be the message in the air. And it's not just Catholics. I do a lot of work in the Bible Belt uh, in Protestant churches. And I once had somebody in a Protestant church tell me, I learned two things growing up in the Bible Belt that never made any sense to me. Sex is evil. Save it for the person you love. <laughs> Just another version of that starvation diet. If that's all we're given, if all we're given is this image of this priest, right? No wonder there are so many converts from the starvation diet to what I call the fast food gospel. Which is the secular culture's promise of immediate gratification for our hunger. I don't know about you, but if those are the only two choices, starve or eat fast food, I'm going for the nuggets. Because <laughs> I am hungry. And do not lie to me, those nuggets taste good going down. <laughs> Especially if you're really hungry. I was really hungry as a teenager, and those nuggets tasted good. But what happens if you eat a lot of fast food? Anybody seen the movie Super Size Me? This guy, in a little experiment, is a documentary. He eats McDonald's breakfast, lunch, and dinner for 30 days straight to see what happened to him. At the end of this experiment, he goes and gets a bunch of medical tests, and the doctor says, You're dying. Your body is shutting down from all the grease and the sodium you've been consuming. That is a picture of me, spiritually speaking, in my college years. I had the tragic experience, this would be 1988, the tragic experience of witnessing a date rape in a college dorm. And this experience haunted me. And the question I was wrestling with and wrestling hard was this. What is it that can lead us as human beings to treat other human beings as nothing but objects for our selfish pleasure. And the more I was furious at this guy I saw do this, the more I had to look at my own heart and say, am I much different in the way I think, in the way I fantasize, in the way I brag to my friends about what I've done? When I'm looking at porn, when I'm with my girlfriend in bed, am I a lover? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. What is, I don't know. Am I loving her or am I I'm probably using her? And I, ha I had to look deeply in my heart and say, I don't think I'm much better. I don't think I'm much better. It's not a matter of date rape when I'm with my girlfriend, but I don't even know what it means to love. I don't know what it means to love. And that put me on my knees. I remember falling on my knees in this college dorm. In 1988, just, oh, God in heaven, if you exist, you better show me why you gave me all these desires because they're getting me in a bed and going to a hell of a lot of trouble. What is your plan? Do you have a plan? It was, it was a ragged, ragged prayer, but it was real. It was honest. And it started me on a journey started me on a journey that led me to this teaching of a crazy Polish guy. Probably heard of him before. Pope John Paul II. And I learned from him, this is my analogy, but this is what I learned from him. Christianity is not a starvation diet. And the fast food is attractive, but it doesn't lead you to the deep satisfaction you're really looking for. He invited me to a banquet. He told me Christianity is a wedding feast. And I devoured this theology of the body in a matter of months. And this was 1993. And I knew I was holding in my hands the answer to the crisis of our times. And I knew that I would spend the rest of my life studying this theology of the body 
and sharing it with the world. See, here's the problem. We all have these, this rocket engine power within us, right? But original sin inverted the rocket engines. And what happens if you set that rocket off? This is why so many of us go out into the world seeking life, seeking love, seeking joy, seeking fulfillment, and it backfires on us. I learned from John Paul II in this theology of the body that Christ came into the world not to condemn those with inverted rocket engines, but to redirect our rocket engines to the stars. So my task over the next 45 minutes or so is to summarize, in 45 minutes, a collection of 129 talks that John Paul II delivered over five years, between 1979 and 1984. If I pique your interest to want to learn more, and I'll give you some ways to do that before we get out of here, I'll give you some ways to learn more. If I pique your interest to want to do that, tonight will have been very well spent. Is that a deal? All right, buckle up, away we go. 129 talks in 45 minutes. So the theology of the body is broken into two parts. The first part is called the words of Christ. And the second part is called the sacrament. The words of Christ and the sacrament. In part one, the words of Christ, we look at three key statements of Jesus. Three key statements. These statements point us back to the beginning. They look at where we are in history right now. And then they point us to our ultimate destiny in our future. We have to look at where we come from, where we are, and where we're headed. If we don't have that frame, we are missing critical information about what it means to be human. And we will have a very limited perspective in trying to answer very big questions. Let me give you an example of what happens when you have limited information and how really wrong you can be. Even when you're convinced you're right, when you get more information, you realize, oh my gosh, I'm so wrong. So here's a little example. True story. Some years ago, I was in the Denver airport in the stall in the men's room doing my business. And another guy comes into the stall next to me and sits down and starts to do his business. And he says, hey, how you doing? <laughs> I said, uh, I'm, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? He says, what are you up to? I said, uh, same thing you are. <laughs> what else could it mean? What? what with the information I had, it made total sense that he was talking. I mean, it was weird, but he was talking to me, and I answered his questions. And then I heard the guy sitting in the stall next to me thinks I'm talking to him. <laughs> what information was I lacking? He was on his phone. <laughs> I didn't know that. So I had a truncated picture of what was going on, right? <laughs> and it was detrimental. <laughs> so we want a total picture of where we come from, where we are, and where we're headed. And if we have that total vision of our humanity, we will be able to answer the really big questions in the right perspective, from the right angle. And the really big questions are these. What does it mean to exist? What am I to do with my life? How am I to live a life that brings true happiness? What does it mean to be human? What's the meaning of love? Why am I a man? Why am I a woman? These are the big, big questions. And in one of his conversations with the Pharisees, Jesus says this, and it is critical for us. He says, I know where I come from, and I know where I'm going. I know where I come from, and I know where I'm going. If we don't know where we come from, 
and we don't know where we're going, we are going to be utterly disoriented in life. We will have no sense of what is up, what is down, what is left, what is right, what's the right way to go, what's the wrong way to go. We will be disoriented. And this disorientation, when we don't know where we come from or where we're going, will manifest itself very pointedly in our bodies, in our sexuality. Our body tells a story. And we have to open our eyes to what John Paul II calls the language of the body. We need to learn how to read the language of the body and listen to its story. And I'll bet you there are very few people in this room who have ever thought of this. Have you ever read the message of your navel? Your navel tells a story. It's not just a lint collector. <laughs> I'm amazed. I, I, I usually wear a white t-shirt and then a colored outer shirt. And somehow the colored outer shirt lint still finds a way to get in the belt. <laughs> lint collector. But it's not just that. Your belly button tells a story. Have you ever thought about this? Listen to the message of your belly button. What is it telling you? What's it telling you? Your mother and hers do not come. You do not come from yourself. You come from your mother. You come from your mother. And your mother didn't bring you into the world by herself. You come from a mother and you come from a father. Your belly button tells that story. And your parents have belly buttons because they came from their parents. And their parents have belly buttons because they came from their parents. And their parents have belly buttons because they came from their parents and 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 their parents. The whole way back to the beginning of time, the first couple that we call Adam and Eve. Which raises a very important question that my friend Matt Pinto tried to address some years ago. Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Good question. But the belly button, if we read its message, it takes us the whole way back to where we come from. <coughs> to where we come from. Go down about five or six inches from your belly button. Your genitals tell a story. And it's basically this. Pay it forward. You exist because somebody paid it forward. You have a belly button because somebody paid it for And each and every one of us, in our own way, not everybody here is going to be called to be married. I'm a married man. I have five kids. Not everybody here is going to be called to be married and raise children. But in one way or another, we are all called to pay it forward. If you are listening to what your body tells you when you are standing there in the shower, in one way or another, every man is called to be a father and a husband. In one way or another. And every woman, in one way or another, is called to be a wife and a mother. To pay it forward. If we listen to the language of our bodies, it will tell us where we come from and where we're headed. Because if you follow all the future human generations, the whole way to the end of time, guess where it all ends? The Bible begins with the marriage of a man and a woman in an earthly paradise. That's our beginning. But it ends, when you pay it the whole way forward, it ends with the marriage of God and humanity, Christ and the church in a heavenly paradise. I'll say it again. The Bible begins with the marriage of man and woman in an earthly paradise. It ends with the marriage of Christ and the church in a heavenly paradise. These two bookends of the Bible provide the key for understanding the whole story that lies between. And here it is in a nutshell. God wants to marry us. God wants to marry us. And he wanted this eternal marital plan to be so plain to us that he stamped an image of it right in our bodies by making us male and female and calling the two to that intimate union. Our bodies are theological. Our bodies tell a divine story. 
So we're seeing these three key words of Jesus. We're going back to the beginning. We're going to look at where we are. And we're going to look at where we're headed in our future. First key word of Jesus. You're probably familiar with the story. The Pharisees come up to Jesus. They question him about divorce. They say, Moses allowed us to divorce our wives. What do you say, Jesus? Jesus says, haven't you read that in the beginning, God made the male and female? Pause right there. Go on to Facebook today. Last time I checked, there were over 60 gender options filling out your personal profile. Over 60 gender options. Uh, when Facebook started listing all these gender options, there was a public outcry, not because there were too few, but because there were, excuse me, not because there were too many, but because there were too few. And so they started listing male, female, and customize. You can customize your gender. How did we get to the point in which material, our bodies, are immaterial? They don't matter anymore. We live in a culture that is incessantly bombarding us with a message that says your body is meaningless. We have a faith that is bold enough to proclaim that the human body reveals ultimate meaning. Ultimately, if you believe in Christmas, if you believe that the Word of God became flesh, you believe that the human body reveals ultimate meaning. If it seems strange to speak of our bodies as a study of God, a theology that reveals the ultimate meaning of the universe, it shouldn't if you believe in Christmas. Through the fact that the Word of God became flesh, John Paul says, the body entered theology through the main door. The sexual difference tells a story, a very, very important story. Because we are made in the image and likeness of God precisely as male and female. Haven't you read, Jesus says, that in the beginning God made the male and female? Jesus is pointing out that something went wrong. We don't see the world the same way anymore. We don't see the world the way it was created in the beginning because our rocket engines have become inverted. There's this tragedy in the human story that theologians call original sin or the fall. And if you want to know proof of the fall, just read the headlines every day. Evil exists because of the fall. The tensions, the frictions, the struggles we have in loving one another. Why is it so hard to love? Why is it so hard, especially for men and women, to love one another? I've been married 21 years. It ain't easy. There's a lot of friction, pain, and tension there. Why? In the beginning, it was not so. Something has gone wrong. And remember my little bathroom story in the Denver airport? When we don't know there was a beginning from which we fell, we, are, we have a, a truncated set of, of ideas about what it means to be human. And we will ascribe things to God that actually belong to the effects of original sin. We will say things like, God made me this way. And he wants me to live this way when in fact what we are feeling in our hearts and in our bodies is the twisting up of something that was originally beautiful and good but got all <laughs> twisted up because of sin. Right? Haven't you read that in the beginning God made the male and female? That's the starting point. And that line of Jesus cuts through all the gender confusion of our world like a hot knife through butter goes right through it. And Jesus goes on to say, therefore what God has joined, man must not separate. And the Pharisees are like, whoa, whoa, Moses allowed us to divorce. And then Jesus says, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. But from the beginning it was not so. Again, he's establishing the beginning as the starting point. This is the norm. If we want to know what it means to be human, 
If we want to know what sex is, if we want to know what love is, if we want to know what marriage is, if we want to know what human existence is, we've got to go back to the beginning. It's as if Jesus is saying, look, you guys are driving around town in cars with flat tires. And the rubber's shredding off the rims. The rims are getting all dented up. Your alignment is way off. And you just think this is normal. Because you're looking around and you're like, well, everybody's car is like this. <laughs> and Jesus is saying, hello, hello, we fly. We fly. In the beginning, they had air in their tires. <laughs> Here's the good news of the gospel. Christ comes into the world not to condemn those with flat tires. Comes into the world to re-inflate our flat tires. This is good news. This is good news. How do we know they had fully inflated tires in the beginning? What is the first result of the air going out of the tires, so to speak? What's the first result of original sin? They realized they were naked and they, they hid themselves. They covered themselves. What were they ashamed of? Their earlobes? <laughs> their, their, their elbows? What did they cover? Their, their kneecaps? What, what did they cover? Precisely those parts of the body that distinguish male and female. Why? We have to ask why. Well, because those are the dirty parts. No, they, uh, there's no, there is no such thing as a dirty body part unless you've been rolling in the mud. <laughs> no such thing. That is a Manichaean heresy that the Catholic Church has repeatedly condemned. Your body is not bad. Your body is not dirty. The old God looked at everything he made and said, it is very good. Why do they cover... They're genitals. Because this is where we specifically feel the effects of the inverted rocket engines. We no longer see the body as the call to holy communion. It's the sexual difference that reveals we are called to love as God loves. Guys, you want a revelation? Are you ready, guys? Am I allowed to say testicles here? <laughs> I just did. <laughs> Guys, do you... There you are, standing there in the shower. Do you know what your testicles are for? We have been given the... You should see the looks on your face. <laughs>
Do you know what your body proclaims? Do you know what the Theotokos is? Is it not? Uh, no, not that one. Theotokos is the uh, icon of Mary with Jesus in there. Or just find Guadalupe. Guadalupe. Or look at this Guadalupe image. There we go. Guadalupe. Alright. So you know she's pregnant, right? She's pregnant here. Because this ribbon is an indication of pregnancy in the Aztec culture. When the Aztecs looked at this image, what they saw, because of the way she does, does her hair, that was a virgin, that's the way the virgins did their hair, this ribbon that she's pregnant, and this four-petaled flower was the sign of the divinity in their culture. So the Aztec Indians looked at this, and they saw virgin pregnant with God. My dear sisters, do you know the dignity of your body? If Christmas is real, if our faith is real, then woman's body has literally become heaven on earth. Because heaven is the dwelling place of God. And if this is real, if Jesus is the Son of God, truly divine, and he was conceived in this woman's womb, woman's body has become heaven on earth, the dwelling place of the Most High God. My dear sisters, do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Guys, do you know? Oh my goodness, do you know what privilege we have? Do you know what privilege we have? We are. Oh. <laughs> it is stamped in our bodies. We are called by God to enter the gates of heaven. To enter the gates of heaven. The problem with our culture today and the way it thinks about sex is not that it overvalues sex. The problem with our culture today has no clue how valuable it is. No clue. I just listened to a podcast the other day uh, by a woman, I wish I could remember her name. She wrote a book on um, sex on college campuses, the, the new hookup culture, something like that. And she says, here's what's going on. The hookup culture rewards carelessness, callousness, and punishes kindness. It rewards Carelessness, callousness, and punishes kindness. You are punished on a college campus today if you get an emotional attachment to the people you're having sex with. That you are, that's a punishable offense. Which means you have to fight everything God designed in your being not to want to be attached to the people you're having sex with. This is the state of affairs we're living in today. Our tires are so flat, we are having so many car troubles. And we're pretending we're having a good time. Are we willing to stop pretending we're having a good time? Isn't it interesting that, that all this sex going on on the college campuses always goes together with booze? Always goes together with booze. Why do we have to numb ourselves? We have to numb ourselves so that we can continue the illusion that we're having fun. It's an illusion. The weekend that changed my life in 1988, when I had that tragic experience, the reason that weekend changed my life is because I committed to one thing, to stay sober for one weekend. So I could actually see what was really going on without beer goggles. Have the courage to remove the numbing agents from your life so that you can actually feel what you really feel. Because our pain is very instructive. If you reach out and touch a hot stove and you have numbed your hand, is that a good thing or a bad thing that you've numbed your hand? It's a bad thing because you're burning and you don't even know it. Your hand is burning off and you don't even know it. Take the numbing agents out of your life and you will, your pain will do its job. 
Listen to your pain. Listen to your pain. You will find God in it. Because God has taken on our pain to show us a whole new way to live. So I don't think we need much demonstrating that something went wrong in the human heart. Something has gone wrong. The tires went flat. Or if you want to use a more biblical image, we could say this. We have all run out of wine. We have all run out of wine. Wine is a symbol in the scriptures of divine love poured out. In the beginning, before sin, the first man and woman were drunk on God's wine. And we know they were drunk on God's wine because they were naked without shame. Nakedness without shame demonstrates that they understood the theology of their bodies. They saw this call to love stamped in their bodies. A man's body doesn't make sense by itself. A woman's body doesn't make sense by itself. Seen in light of each other, they discovered this call to holy, life-giving communion. And they desired nothing other than to love as God loves in their bodies. But if the very purpose of the sexual relationship is to share God's love, or, using the analogy, to share God's wine, what's going to happen to the sexual relationship when you run out of wine? That's what happened in the original sin. The sexual urge became inverted. And Adam is no longer saying, this is my body given up for you. Adam is now saying, that's your body and you're taking it from me. But Eve is saying, hold on, don't look at me that way. I'm not meant to be used as an object for your selfish pleasure. She covers herself to protect the holiness and dignity of her body. Goes the other way too. Do we have that greeting card? The Hallmark card? Somebody once sent me this greeting card that I thought demonstrated pretty well the differences. Don't have it? No? Okay, so it's a greeting card that has a, a, a teenage girl at the top and a teenage girl at the bottom and, and she's looking at him and he's looking at her and the little bubble off her head says... Prince Charming. And the little bubble off his head says, Boobies. <laughs> and then at the bottom it says, Where all the trouble begins. Here it is. Prince Charming, Boobies, Where the trouble begins. So this is what has happened with the inversion of the rocket engines. We are looking at one another now, not as men and women made in the image of God, who are meant to be honored and loved in the image of God. We're looking at one another as objects for our own ends, our own pleasures, our own preferences, our own selfish desires. And we treat others as objects. We treat others as trophies. I'm going to date that girl because if I date that girl, I'll get more status because she's hot. <laughs> What does that even mean? What does that even what does that even what does that even I mean what does that mean? We evaluate on something so external, and this causes each and every one of us so much pain. Now I want to go back to that lithby lecture that we got from Father Abruzzi in that movie. There is a beast living within each and every one of you <laughs> whose name is Lust. Lust. Now, okay, Lust is real. Lust is real. And, we, and he was right, that priest, even though he didn't say it in the right way, he was right to say we must never confuse love with lust. And we do it all the time. Lust is what happens to erotic desire when the tires go flat. Lust is what happens to erotic desire when we run out of wine. We're not loving one another when we're lusting. We're using one another. But we call it love. It's not love. Let's just be honest. And don't call things love that aren't love.
So how do we get out of this mess? We're in a mess. We are in a mess. We yearn for love, but we substitute lust because we don't really know how to love. We're, we're, in a, we're in a serious mess. I got some good news for you. Where did Jesus perform his first miracle? At a wedding. And what did he do at this wedding? He restored the wine to the sexual relationship in super abundance. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> so this couple ran out of wine. This couple ran out of wine. Are you following the symbolism here? John Paul II tells us the couple running out of wine in Cana is a symbol of the original sin. And Jesus restoring the wine is the symbol of everything he came to do. Do you know how much wine Jesus brought to this party? This is at the end of the party, folks. And Jesus says, where are you guys going? There's more. Six stone jars, each containing about 25 gallons. Do the math. 150 gallons. That's about 750 bottles of the best stuff you can imagine. For the end of the party. Where do we get the idea that Jesus is a party pooper? <laughs> do you know what the goal of the Christian life is from this perspective? It's to get utterly plastered. <laughs> on God's wine. On God's wine. Do you know what's being mocked at a frat party where everybody's getting drunk and trying to have sex? What's being mocked? The wedding feast of Canaan. That's what's being mocked. That's all that the lies can do. That's all the enemy can do is mock the true, the good, and the beautiful. The devil does not have his own clay. Don't give it to him. He doesn't have his own clay. All he can do is take God's clay and twist it up. That's what a frat party is. It's the twisting up of God's clay. When Jesus, and this is the second key word of Jesus that we want to look at, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you've heard the commandment not to commit adultery. But I tell you, if you even look lustfully, you're already committing adultery in your heart. See, Jesus is after our hearts. He's not just out there to lay down some rule. He says, you've already heard the rule not to commit adultery. The problem is, your heart's been twisted up. Let me in your heart and let me untwist it. Let me redirect your rocket engines to the stars. Let me give you a visual here. If you've seen me do this on YouTube, just pretend you haven't. <laughs> I want you to imagine this is the most beautiful painting you have ever seen in your life. Do I hear some moves? Do I hear some odds? Thanks for playing. What is this a painting of? This is a painting, the most beautiful thing you can imagine. This is man and woman, naked without shame, just as God made us to be in the beginning. There's nothing more beautiful. There's a reason we are attracted to the naked human body. There's nothing wrong with being attracted to the naked human body. In fact, there's something wrong if you're not attracted to the naked human body. But in what manner are we being attracted to the naked human body? Are we reducing the naked human body to a thing for my pleasure? That's what we've got to ask. And this is what Jesus is proposing to us, or point, putting out for us in the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying you're looking at the body in the wrong way. And what he's really saying is, let me show you how to look at the human body in the right way. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. If we are looking at this painting rightly, what we will see is the image of God revealed through the naked human body. There's nothing more beautiful. This painting is a religious icon because the union of man and woman is the main icon the Bible uses to point
point us to heaven. So we've got to go to our third key word from Jesus right now. This time he's discussing marriage with the Sadducees. And he says, in the resurrection, at the end of time, in the resurrection of the dead, men and women are no longer given in marriage. Wait a minute. You mean, you mean, you mean we get to heaven and God just pushes the delete button on marriage? He pushes the complete button on marriage. Remember the two bookends of the Bible? Begins with the marriage of man and woman in an earthly paradise. Ends with the marriage of Christ and the church in a heavenly paradise. Which one of these marriages is the ultimate fulfillment of all of our aching, wild, hungering desire for infinite life and love? Which marriage can alone satisfy our desire for infinite love? This one. What's the purpose then of this painting? To point us to heaven. To be a sign here on earth, an icon that points us. Jesus is saying, you no longer need a sign to point you to heaven when you are in heaven because you're there. You no longer need the rocket boosters when you've arrived at your destiny. You're there. So here's the main point of the theology of the body, the main idea. The whole reason we are male and female, the whole reason we are designed this way, the whole reason the two are called to become one flesh, is to point us to Christ's marriage with the church. St. Paul summarizes it, and here we're now into part two of the theology of God. St. Paul summarizes the whole Bible according to John Paul II when he says this. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Where's that a quote from? Genesis. The book of Genesis, back to the beginning. And then St. Paul adds this. This is a great mystery. And it refers to Christ and the church. How? How does sexuality refer to Jesus? Did you know, first of all, did you know that? Did you know sex is all about Jesus? Sex is all about Jesus. Everything is meant to point to Jesus. Everything. Can we get the image of the unity cross up here, please? Let me point out that it was Christ who left his father in heaven. It was Christ who left the home of his mother on earth. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. Christ left his father, he left his mother to give up his body for his bride, the church, so that we, the bride of Christ, might become one flesh with him. Where do we become one flesh with Christ? In the you. <laughs> Any Bishop Fulton Sheen fans out there? Woo! Here's how he puts it. Do you know what's happening at the foot of the cross? <laughs> Is the model and the prototype 
of all of the sacraments in the whole Christian life. Because the goal of all of the sacraments is to unite the bride with the bridegroom so that the bride might conceive eternal life. See, not only does God love us, not only does God want to marry us, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby and the baby cage. What we didn't realize in second grade when we learned that pithy little rhyme is we're actually reciting some profound theology. It's called theology of the... Our bodies tell this story. God loves us, wants to marry us, and He wants the bride to conceive eternal life. It's not a metaphor. Mary is the image of the bride, and she conceived eternal life. Mary at the foot of the cross is the symbol of the church. And I know what you're thinking, whoa, 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 oh, that's his mother there. How can she be the bride as well? It's a spiritual marriage. Don't get funky on me. It's a spiritual marriage. <laughs> it's a mystical union of their hearts. And how do we know that this mystical union of their hearts is fertile? How do we know that? What does Jesus say to the woman? Woman, behold your son, the beloved disciple. That's all of us. If you were baptized, guess what? You were born again. Born again? Can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? Nicodemus asks. Notice how Jesus bases the entire reality of entering heaven on an understanding of sex. He says, Nicodemus, if you don't understand the earthly reality of generation, how are you going to understand the heavenly reality of regeneration? Because grace builds on nature. This is why when we get the natural reality of sex wrong, guess what else we get wrong? Our heavenly destiny. Because this painting points us to heaven. You ready to understand what's going on in the world today? With the attack on sex? Are you ready? Here we go, and I'll close on this point. If there is an enemy who wants to keep us from heaven, and if this painting is the main clue... God has given the universe to point the whole universe to heaven. How does the enemy feel about this painting? You're exactly right. He's jealous. He fell out of envy. That's what the scripture says. Lucifer fell out of envy. Envy? What do we have that he doesn't have? What it, Lucifer's what? An angel, right? What do we have that angels don't have? Bodies. What can we do with our bodies that angels can't do? Participate in the fatherhood of God. Lucifer fell out of envy. What does he envy? Precisely our sexuality, our fertility, our ability to participate in the life-giving love of God. This is why he aims all his arrows at this painting. And here's what has happened to this painting. Ever since the dawn of original sin, but in a particularly pointed way, it's going on in the world right now. It's become terribly twisted up and distorted. And here is the classic mistake of religious people. Religious people encounter the painting in its crumpled up form, and what does it look like? Trash. Trash. And what do we think the solution is? Throw it away. This is why we grow up thinking something like this. Spirit good, body bad. This is not Christianity. That is a heresy called Puritanism, Manichaeism, Gnosticism, Jansenism, all kinds of other isms, but it ain't Catholicism. <laughs> Two men in the 20th century 
responding to this Puritanism, reached into this trash can, pulled this out, and started telling the modern world, you mustn't throw this away. One man's name was Hugh Hefner, founder of Playboy magazine and one of the main architects of the sexual revolution. He said, when he started Playboy magazine in the early 1950s, he said, I started Playboy magazine as my personal response to the hurt and hypocrisy of Puritanism in my strict Christian upbringing. And he started saying to the modern world, don't you want to look at this? Don't you want to look at this? Was Hugh Hefner right to tell the modern world we mustn't throw this away? Yes. On this point, he was right. But where was he wrong and with dreadful consequence? He left the painting just like this in his crumpled up form. And because 99% of us were raised on the starvation diet, when Hugh Hefner started showing the modern world the fast food, we started eating it. And how are we doing 60 years later? Are we sexually liberated or are we sexually addicted? My brothers and sisters, you have three choices with your desires. Three choices with arrows. You're either going to become a stoic. What does the stoic do with desire? Suppress. Repress, repress. You're either going to become a stoic, an addict. What does an addict do with desire? Indulges it in all kinds of pleasures that can never really satisfy. Or you're going to become an aspiring mystic. Can we get a picture of Teresa of Avila up here? My well, brothers and sisters, she wasn't even married. <laughs> or was she? What is celibacy in this picture? Christ calls some to remain celibate for the sake of the kingdom. kingdom. What's the kingdom? It's the eternal marriage. This woman is married to the big guy. She skipped the earthly sign in order to open all of her most wild, aching, yearning for love and union to the only marriage that can truly satisfy. But remember, Jesus says we have to distinguish between the wise and the unwise virgins, right? What's the difference between the wise and the unwise virgins? The unwise virgins have no oil for their lamps. Their hearts are cold. They are repressing. They are the Stoics. Are you tracking with me? The aspiring mystics are on fire. Their lamps are lit. That girl is on fire! <laughs> that girl is on fire! She's on fire. Christ came to cast fire on the earth, and she caught it. So did another young aspiring mystic in the early 1950s. Right at the same time Hugh Hefner was starting Playboy magazine, a young Polish mystic pulled this out of the trash can and started saying to the modern world, you mustn't throw this away. But he did something Hugh Hefner didn't do. By reflecting deeply on God's plan for man and woman in the beginning, by following our navels the whole way back to the beginning, and by following our genitals the whole way forward to the marriage of the Lamb, this young Polish mystic started uncrumpling the painting for us so we could rediscover who we really are, so we could understand yet again what it means that God made us male and female in the image and likeness of His own eternal exchange of life-giving love. My brothers and sisters, the world is absolutely fixated on this crumpled up piece of paper, and maybe you are too. Within it 
is the truth you're really looking for. But we have to undergo a major rearranging of the furniture in our hearts, the redirecting of our rocket engines, the uncrumpling of the painting, so we can rediscover the Lord. It's called Christianity. It's called taking up your cross and following Jesus. It's called the good news of the gospel. It's also called living the theology of our lives. In the words of the prophet Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. Tonight is an important night, and um, so we're going to take a few minutes to, we're not going to have long, maybe 15, 20 minutes to break up into some small groups, but I really want to um, invite and encourage everyone to really enter in and to encounter one another in these groups. Um, maybe if you have opted out of the small groups in the past weeks, or maybe not really entered in, um, I really want to invite and challenge you to do so on our last night. Um, we are so lucky. Uh, we're, we're part of a blessed few that get to hear a message like this, that get to hear from Christopher, that even know what the words theology of the body mean or refer to. Um, this is a big gift. And, um, and, I, and I just encourage you to, to reverence that gift and to take advantage of it tonight while we're here. Um, I imagine probably the majority of us could sit in our chairs and listen to Christopher talk for many, many more hours. And there are ways to do so. I'll remind you at the end of who you can talk to about how you can make that happen. Um, but in the meantime, let's go ahead and, and break up into some small groups. Um, I encourage you just to stay close to where you are now. Maybe just break into groups of about six, six to eight, um, and, and just we'll keep it local, keep it exactly where you are. And if you are a small group leader, you know who you are, and have your questions up here. So just come up, grab them. Um, we have about fifteen or so minutes. Please raise your hands and a leader will come to you. 
you do not have a leader in your small group, raise your hands and the leader will come to you.
complementarity of the sexes, the of the body, to help me better understand the mystery of God's love for us revealed through our bodies. The theology of the body gives access to these great teachings of the Catholic Church, of Christianity in general, but in a language that's understandable for the culture today. Theology of the body will definitely change me as a mother, it's going to change me as a wife for the better. Um, I'm going to be able to love better. It's enabled me to embrace authentic masculinity, and I've become more fully alive because of it. The Theology of the Body Institute was formed in 2004 with a very simple mission, and that is to educate every man and woman in this beautiful teaching of the Theology of the Body. The Theology of the Body Institute courses take place at a retreat center in Coralville, Pennsylvania. You just sit in this beautiful retreat center with places to walk, and you've got people of all different races, and people from different countries, people of different faiths, there's this great Protestant brothers and sisters here with us. I honestly, Michelle, was scared to come here because I'm not, I'm not a good student at all, but this is not a difficult classroom style. And he put it in a way that I understood it. In making theology of the body of our own, we need time not just to hear ideas, but to process them, both in our mind and most importantly in our hearts. There's time of prayer and rest, and the sacramental life is also encouraged. By no means would we have been able to get from a book or a tape series or a CD series what we've been able to get by coming to the actual immersion program. If you come and learn these beautiful teachings through our gifted faculty and staff in our particular unique environment, you literally are participating in changing the world. I don't think we would be sitting here together if it were for the theology of the body. It's a teaching for our time. I didn't have balance in my life until I studied theology of the body. Now I know how to live as a priest. This is something that will drive a new evangelization. It will change hearts and lives when people understand and live these beautiful teachings of the theology of the body. The church, the world will never be the same. So the next course that I'm teaching is June 18th to the 23rd. The Theology of the Body Institute has a table out there. Please visit them to learn more. Uh, there are scholarship funds available as well if that is needed. Love, love, love to have you as a student for one of our five day courses. Um, could you bring up the slide that shows the email? Book? I urge you to sign up for our email list. You'll get my free new ebook, Theology of Body at the Movies, where I unpack a bunch of movies and unfold the themes of the Theology of Body that you find in the second of movies. Just go to coreproject.com and click on the link for the. Uh, the uh, free ebook, and you'll get on our email list that way. And uh, you can also learn more about the membership program we have. We give ongoing formation in the theology of the body through a monthly subscription service we have. You can learn more about that at our website as well. Just briefly, a couple things we have out on the table. A bunch of CDs. How many parents do we have here? A bit moms and dads. All right. How many married people are here? Okay. How many people hope to be married someday? Hope you raise your family. Okay. <laughs> this is a CD series you're going to want. It's called Beyond the Talk. Sharing God's plan for sexuality with your children. 99% of us were raised on a starvation diet. Do not repeat the cycle. I beg of you. Do not repeat the cycle. How do we engage? This can help. It's not the end all be all, but it can help. Okay, uh, a bunch of other CDs we have out there. We have one on Mary and the image of the tilma. There's so much in that tilma. I was just scratching the surface of the surface. The tilma tells the story of the theology of body. And it changed the Aztec culture from a culture of death into a culture of life. Mary's doing something very similar in our own day. So listen to this on the Tilma, and I think what Mary's doing in our own day is more closely related to Fatima. So this is on Fatima and the theology of the body, and the connections between the two will amaze you. I kid you not. On the Eucharist, yes, Fatima's coming up on the 100th anniversary in May, May, May 13th. Uh, the Eucharist is the satisfaction of the deepest desires of our hearts. There's my book, Fill These Hearts, God, Sex, and the Universal Longing. If you like the talk tonight... This would probably be the best book to go to. It's kind of a prequel to the Theology of the Body. And there are some free copies of Theology of the Body for beginners back there. And my book, Pope Francis to Go, 
if you're interested in learning more about Francis. And then, finally, we are doing a pilgrimage to Ireland this summer. Yes, sweet. Yeah, kid is sweet. St. Bridget of Ireland. One of my favorites. St. Bridget of Ireland describes heaven as a big lake of beer. And we are going in search of this lake of beer in Ireland, and we're going to dive into it together. We're going to be following the footsteps of St. Patrick and Our Lady of Knox. Please join us. Pick up a flyer and learn more. That's all I have to say about that. What are your questions? What's on your mind? What's on your heart? Anybody? Yes, shout it out. Two thousand twelve at the institute. Yes. Tell me your name. Hi, Sasha. Good to see you again, Sasha. <laughs> how many? How many have been to one of our five-day courses? Show of hands. Could you please share with three other people tonight before you leave why they need to go? Why don't you go? Okay. Go ahead, Sasha. Yes. And um, going back to your other question with the aha moments, um, my big aha moment from. You're, I'm sorry, say the word again. What? Aha moment. Oh, aha moment. Aha moment. I didn't hear you. Got it. Aha moment. Yes. Instead of something that unites us. Yes. And helps us connect in a much deeper way. Yes. That's so, a great way to put it. So I'm curious to know in, um, in the different cultures that you have been in, what have you been in contact with and, and counseled and taught throughout all these years? What are some things that have helped reorient that outlook? That, that understanding of what chastity is? Yes. In a way that you're not talking about temptation. You're not you're not treading that line. You're just seeing it in a whole other light. Yes. Let me let me let me jump right in if you don't mind, just for the sake of time. And and point. Do we have the image of chastity from the Vatican? You were the one talking about the unicorn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so, chastity. Chastity, what is it? It is not repression. It is not the life of the Stoic. It's the life of the aspiring mystic. Right? Chastity is not a, a negation of sexuality. It's the highest affirmation of the truth and meaning of sexuality. Does it take effort? Does it take discipline? Yes. But it's a creative discipline. It's like the discipline of a pianist or, or an athlete, right? Anybody, we don't have a piano in here, do we? Okay, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Anybody can walk up to a piano keyboard and bang on it and make meaningless noise, right? A concert pianist can also walk up to a piano keyboard and tickle those keys to the point that it makes exquisite music and lifts our hearts to the heavens. But we know behind that beautiful music is a lifetime of discipline, sacrifice, and effort in order to make beautiful music. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? So not everyone is called to be a professional athlete or a professional musician, but each and every one of us is called by Christ to be a professional lover. And that is chastity, the discipline of the musician, the discipline of the athlete. That's chastity in its proper expression. Here's how the church, in her art, depicts the virtue of chastity. This is in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Up in the nave of the church, in the arches, you have all the Christian virtues. And this is the Christian virtue of chastity. Now I know what the guys noticed right away. 
the curve of this plant right here. It's very lovely, right? I know what a lot of you are thinking. Chastity? That's a bare-breasted woman. How could that be chastity? Which demonstrates exactly that we don't know what chastity is. We're wearing our starvation diet puritanical glasses. In order to understand why there's a bare-breasted woman in the middle of chastity, we have to go to charity. Can you go to the virtue of charity? Do you know that one? Yes, no, maybe so. It's the... Uh, <laughs> Okay, so here is charity. These are two depictions of charity in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It's a child at the breast and a mother expressing her milk. She's actually squeezing her breasts. The Catholic Church, the Catholic Church, the real Catholic Church, this is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome can think of no more fitting image of what Christian love is than a woman giving her milk. And let these images, this is sacred art, my brothers and sisters. This is sacred art. This is what we yearn for when we're going to porn, which is anything but sacred art. Pornography is the diabolic mockery of this. Pornography is the diabolic mockery, right? So here's the beauty, beauty of the body, and here's pornography. That's pornography. What we're looking for is the real beauty, the real meaning, the real purpose. In our world today, we don't even know what a women's breasts are for anymore. We don't know what breasts are for. We got it exactly backwards. Because if you go into a Target and you breastfeed your baby, you're going to get kicked out of the store. But you go through the checkout aisle, which I call cleavage aisle, and you get bombarded by semi-pornographic images. We don't know what the body's for anymore. Listen to this verse of Scripture and let it heal you, both the men and the women in here. Let it heal you. Blessed are the breasts that you nursed. Blessed are the breasts upon which you sucked. Blessed is the womb that bore him. Blessed are the breasts upon which you sucked. Blessed and holy is a woman's body. Blessed and holy is a woman's body. When we understand this is the meaning of Christ, this is a symbol of Christian love, now we can go back to chastity. What's at the center of chastity? Love. Love is dead and centered in Christian chastity. But notice what love is doing. Love is uniting the masculine and the feminine. There are two symbols in this in charity's hands. Two symbols in charity's hands. One's a masculine symbol, one's a feminine symbol. Hmm, which is which? <laughs> Notice how delicately love is reverencing the flower. Delicately holding the flower. Firmly holding the horn of the unicorn. But bringing the two together. Chastity in the mind of the church unites the masculine and the feminine with the truth of love. There's so much more I can say about this understanding of chastity from the perspective of the church, but I'm going to have to refer you to this book where I go into great detail about this image and why it references chastity, what the meaning of the unicorn is, what the meaning of the flower is. I go into much more detail. But I'm just holding that out to, un to untwist all these distorted ideas we have in our minds and hearts about what chastity is. We have been formed, as Sasha said, by Puritanism, not by Catholicism. And so we, we need to let the Lord in there to rearrange the furniture in our hearts. Lord, come and bathe us, come and cleanse us of diseased images and ideas we have on the one hand about the body and on the other hand about chastity and show us who we really are. Anybody else? Question? Question?
comment. Yes. Yes. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Can I speak of mercy? Yes, I can speak of mercy because I am desperately in need of it myself. <laughs> Let me speak to you first of what mercy means and then I'll tell you a short story of mercy in my own life. Mercy, the Latin is misericordia and it means a heart that gives itself to those in misery. I grew up thinking wrongly that my misery repulsed God. Be a good Catholic boy. Be a good Catholic boy. Be a good Catholic boy. Okay, I know I'm not, because there's all kinds of stuff I want to do that good Catholic boys don't do. But I want to pretend I'm good because I don't want to get in trouble, so what am I going to do? I'm going to wear a mask. And pretend I'm a good Catholic boy when inside I know I'm not. And I'm doing all this other stuff on the side and hiding it all. Bring that pattern into adult life that you have people just wearing mask after mask after mask. And they're never getting naked before God. Because we're projecting all this stuff onto God. God is not repulsed by our misery. He's attracted to us by it. That's what Holy Week is all about. It is God descending into the very depths of human misery in order to pull us out. So we've got to learn how to expose our misery to God rather than bury it and hide it. So what's original sin? I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. What's the Christian life? I trusted in His mercy, so I exposed myself. I knew I was loved, so I made myself naked. Because perfect love casts out all fear. Okay, so, here's a little story of mercy in my life. Number one ingredient in any successful human relationship, I am utterly convinced, is mercy. Mercy. I'm going to take you to November 1996. Wendy and I were celebrating our first wedding anniversary. We were at a party, and uh, somebody said, so how's the first year of marriage been? I said, you know, a lot of people think the first year of marriage can be pretty tough, but for me and Wendy, it's been easy. Years later, like 18 years later, <laughs> my wife would tell me, that's when I knew you were utterly clueless. <laughs> that cluelessness was to last about another nine years or so. Not that our first ten years were rosy and peachy all the time. We had our struggles like anybody. But overall, I thought the first ten years of marriage were great. I had a great wife, I had great kids, I was traveling the world as a best-selling author and lecturer, and right around the 10-year mark of our marriage, I was offered a very lucrative book deal by the biggest publishing house in the world. My ship had come in. Or, so I thought. Little did I know, my ship was taking on a lot of water and sinking fast. And I would come to learn through some very painful trials that I was wearing a lot of masks. And I was looking to my wife to be for me what only God can be, my perfect fulfillment. And it was putting a burden on another human being that no human being can bear. The first trial hit in my life when I told my wife the, the title of that book that the big New York publisher wanted me to write. They whined me, they dined me, they offered me a lot of money. I came home from this New York business trip. Honey, this New York publisher wants me to write a book for her husband. It's called Loving Her Rightly. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> you should have seen the look on Wendy's face when I told her the title of that book. <laughs> well, what's the problem? She said, honey, 
you and I need to talk. <laughs> and it's going to be long, and it's going to be painful. The message was loud and clear. I was in no place to be writing a book for husbands called Loving Her Rightly. I did not pursue that book deal. Instead, I let my wife tell me what it was like for the last 10 years to be married to the theology of the body guy. And she was right. It was long and it was painful. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Each and every one of us, Jesus says it, we are wheat and weeds growing together. There's a lot of wheat in my marriage. I was not crazy to think I had a great marriage. I did. But there were also a lot of weeds and I wasn't looking at them. Because I was too afraid that if my, this is a Polish term, if my shitsky came out, <laughs> that my wife wouldn't love me anymore. You can't sleep in the same bed with somebody for 10 years and not smell the shitsky. <laughs> It's there. We all have it. Theology of the body. Okay? Every aspect of your body is theological, including that. <laughs> we can talk honestly about spiritual constipation. What happens physically if you're constipated? You're not getting the... You're not getting it out. What happens physically? What happens to your health? goes way into, like it affects your whole body. You become toxified, right? Is that a word? <laughs> I mean, apply it. Apply it spiritually. Because your body is a theology lesson. We all have spiritual sewage in our lives. All of us. Big doses of it. And if we aren't getting it out on a regular basis, you are spiritually constipated. And that affects your whole spiritual life. What's the spiritual latrine? Confession. Get all of it out. Shit it all out of the priest. <laughs> Get it out. That's what he's there for. He's heard it all before. Get it out. Get it out. Get it out. All of it. Get it out. I was burying a lot of it because I was so afraid. I had to have everything together. I had to have it all right because I was the theology of the body guy. Mercy loves us in all of our stench. And we all desperately need mercy. My spiritual director changed my whole life when he said this. He says, Christopher, you are a recovering perfectionist. And you think a saint is someone who's perfect. Uh-uh. A saint is someone who knows he or she is perfectly loved in all of his or her imperfections. A saint is not someone who's perfect. A saint is someone who knows they're perfectly loved in all their imperfections. That's the journey. Is getting naked before God. Not because we're perfect, because we're not. And we desperately need His mercy. We have time for one or two more. Anybody? Yes. So, you know, I have studied the Bible, I've only seen you a couple of times, about one night kind of thing. Yes. And it, for me, I'm sure it's, like, it's, it's amazing teaching, but I always seem to be left with the feeling of the challenge of how do I share this with others? Like, how do I, like, it's easy to talk to my brothers and sisters a little bit. Mm -hmm. not really easy. It's easy to talk to my wife about it. But when I meet someone, how do I share that? Yes. I find the door really opens widely if you just say something like this. Follow all these rules, you're going to help. I find it creates real openness. <laughs> Excellent opportunity for dialogue. So give that a shot, see how it goes. <laughs> Stupid jokes aside. What are the first words out of the mouth of Jesus in the Gospel of John? 
Anybody know? Who said that? Who do you say? High five. High five. Yes! Lauren Joyce just said, what are you looking for? What do you seek? What do you desire? Other translations. What are you looking for? This is where we begin. In any dialogue with another human being about the gospel, it begins just as Jesus begins. What are we looking for? I have climbed the highest mountain. I have run through the fields only to be with you. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. What are we looking for? What are we looking for? Everybody's got a hungry heart. I've got this burning, yearning, yearning feeling inside me. Oh, deep inside me, and it hurts so bad. What is that? This is where the catechism of the Catholic Church begins. Because this is where Christ begins. With a reflection on human desire. Because it's burning in us. Pope Benedict says, what is needed in the new evangelization is what he calls a pedagogy of desire. And by that he means an education in what that ache of the human heart is and where we take it. As I once heard it said, evangelization is nothing other than one hungry person showing another hungry person where to find bread. Begin with the hunger. Begin with the ache. Begin with belonging. That's where Jesus begins. That's where the catechism begins. That's where we should begin. We have time for one more. Yes. Yes. And you are saying it's raining, man. <laughs>
uh, how's it go? I, I forget the melody, but it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Right? Are we willing to make ourselves vulnerable? Oh, there, there's another one that came out just a couple years ago. Uh, hearts on the no cards on the table. We're all showing hearts. What's that one? Because oh, because all of you and all me loves all of you. Love your curves and all your edges, all your perfect imperfections. Right there, that's the total gift right there. All. Will you love all of me? I love all of you. Will you love all of me? I want to love all of you. I don't know about you. The question that has haunted me my whole life is not, can I win people's approval? Because anybody can learn that game and do it. And that means wearing lots of masks to win people's approval. I know how to do that. I've been a pro at that. Way back to kindergarten, I started learning that game. And played it all throughout grade school and high school and college. And in some ways I still play it because I'm still unlearning those bad habits. But the question that has haunted me my whole life is, am I loved when all the masks are removed? Am I loved when I make myself naked? Am I loved when I'm vulnerable? If I'm not loved there, I'm not loved. And I know the people who have blessed me most in my life are those who have had the courage to take the risk with me in making themselves vulnerable to me. Here's the alternative. Here are our choices. Press through our fear of making ourselves vulnerable or shut yourself up in loneliness for the rest of your life. Those are the only two options. They really are the only two options. What is Jesus doing on the cross? You know, loincloths were not part of the gruesome spectacle of Roman crucifixion. Jesus is making himself utterly naked before all of humanity. And he's saying, here is my naked body given for you. He places it right in our hands. And what do we do? We nail it to a tree. It is the ultimate rejection of the ultimate vulnerability. And Jesus knew we were going to do it. And he still did it. He still made himself vulnerable. That's why he slept sweat blood in the garden. If Jesus did not sweat blood in the garden, I cannot relate to this man. He's a superhuman or something. He's not superhuman. He's a human. And he sweat blood because he knew what he was doing. He was making himself vulnerable and he was going to be utterly rejected in doing so. But that's what saved the world. And not just the world in the abstract. That's what's saving us here, right here, right now, tonight. That some man 2,000 years ago said, I'm going for it. I'm making myself vulnerable. I'm getting out on the dance floor. I'm getting naked. I'm going to bear my heart. I'm going to show the world who I am. It changed the whole world. If you let Jesus love you there, He will show you how you are called to love others in a similar way by making yourself vulnerable. And you too can play your role in changing the world. The Culture Project is playing its role in changing the world. And we need to join together so that this project can do its work. And I want to close my time tonight by just encouraging you to really consider supporting the culture project. Let me tell you, let me show you what's at stake. Here's the culture right here. It's a mess. It's an utter mess. Wars, crime, drugs, poverty, sex trafficking, uh, uh, disease. Uh, just go down the list. It's a culture of death. How many would agree with me? Our world has a cancer. Our culture has a cancer. Okay. If we want to make a difference, if we want to heal that cancer, we've got to treat the cancer at the cellular level. Everybody with me there? 
What's the fundamental cell of society? The family. Go one step deeper. What's the nucleus of that cell? The very core of the family. What is it? Marriage. Marriage. But what do the married people do to have a family? It's the sexual embrace. John Paul II says the sexual embrace is the ontological core of the family. Let me paint a picture for you. Here's the culture at large. Here's the fundamental cell right here. Sexual union builds and shapes families. Families build and shape neighborhoods. Neighborhoods build and shape communities. Communities build and shape cities. Cities build and shape states. Nations build, states shape nations, nations shape the world. If the world is chaotic and cancer is here, it's because the cancer is right here. We don't know what sex is for. When men and women are using one another, when their sexual choices are not aimed at the next generation, but are just aimed at their own selfish pleasure, what does, what's the goal of sex then? When pleasure is the name of the game, what's the goal? Pleasure. pleasure. <laughs> what does the other person become? An object. And I'll stay with you as long as you give me what? Pleasure. As soon as you no longer give me the pleasure I'm after, what am I going to do? See ya. Bye-bye. What happens to the family? Starts to break down. What happens to the neighborhood? Starts to break down. What happens to the community, the city, the state, the nation? It all breaks down. The reason the world is breaking down is because we don't know the meaning of our sexuality. And we don't know how to love the culture project exists to inject health and healing here, which has the ripple effect the whole way down to here. The culture project needs your help. Be generous. Be generous in offering your help to the culture project. much, Christopher. I hope that everyone takes a, a minute on your way out to stop by the tables of the core project and um, Theology of the Body Institute. Um, if you want to hear more, this night has been such a gift. Can we just have one more round of applause? Thank you. by what Christopher has to say, and I also want to um, to ask you to keep him in your prayers also. You know, you can imagine that someone who is speaking so much truth into such a dark world and a confused world, you better believe that there is spiritual attack surrounding that mission. So um, please, as, as your gratitude for tonight, if you do nothing else, say a prayer for Christopher, say a prayer for the people who are fighting this battle, say a prayer for the culture project. Um, say a prayer for the Theology Body Institute. Um, really, this is this is a battleground. Um, but moving forward, we're almost done. We're wrapping up. We're in the home stretch, guys. Thank you for your patience. Um, but I, I wanna. Uh, I, I think it's fitting that, that someone asked how they could uh, how they could help spread this message and how they could be a part of sharing this with the world. And um, just like Christopher said, that that's why the Culture Project exists. And uh, I want to invite up a dear friend of the Culture Project, a man who's been involved for quite a while. Um, actually, the man we all have to thank for, for making tonight happen, um, Mr. Rob Mergen, is going to share a few words. This is, um, I just want to thank Christopher again for the Culture Project, for putting us all this on Christopher's transparency how it makes it exciting to be a Catholic again, you know, so let's just give one more round of applause for everybody. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can just so you know why I care so much to make sure Christopher was here. I just want to just tell you a little bit about myself and how just how moving Christopher's journey and his passion for Pope John Paul's teachings has changed my life. Um, as a young boy, 
you know, in my heart, and I think a lot of us as young guys think this too, we know sex is something big, something important. And my high school friends, as I got older, I was like, boy, there's not a lot of people that are believing in what my parents would tell me to believe in as a Catholic and all that stuff. So I'm like, well, what am I going to do now? I need friends now that believe in this stuff. People like you guys that are like support, or at least, even if they make mistakes, at least they're sort of a camaraderie. And so I didn't see the Catholic Church, so what did I do? I heard the Protestant Church, the Body Evangelical Church, they have a full time youth leader and all this stuff, and oh, and they would talk about this stuff. Similar to tonight, talk about our desires. But Dick would just say, like, well, don't do it. Or how far too far, and, you know, sort of abstinence kind of thing. And, you know, sex is good in marriage, but never to the level that we got to tonight. And so I got kind of wrapped up in the Protestant church for many years. I got lured away from the, the Catholic church. And I want to just tell you that this is such an incredible way to evangelize to people who maybe don't understand their Catholic faith. Like, what a great topic to talk about with your coworkers when they start talking about marriage and sex, you can actually say, you know what, the Catholic Church is all for sex and marriage. And it's exciting and it's wonderful. And we're meant to have these desires. And so I just I just want to share with you that in my life this attracted me back to the Catholic faith. When I talk to coworkers and they talk about marriage and what's going on in our world, I have a foundation to say why we believe marriage is important, why the, the difference of the sex is so, so important. Why do we even have this, you know, hot factor? Why is she attractive? This, this passion that we have, desire for union, it relates back to how much Christ loves us. It's his hot factor passion that we're celebrating for us as people. What an amazing thing. I mean, it almost, it chokes me up just to think that God loves us that much, that he's given in the flesh, this Male-female dynamic is challenging as crazy as you can feel at times to remind us how much he loves to us as people. He's passionate for us. He's hot for us. He wants to be married to us spiritually more. And we get to do that every week in the Eucharist. So what an amazing thing we have. And I just want to explain that the Culture Project is doing such an amazing thing here but their greater vision is that high school kid like me, where they can tailor this kind of message in a stealthy kind of way that a kid's going to understand someone like me in seventh, sixth, seventh, eighth grade is going to go, hmm, you mean the Catholic Church is not against all my desires? And they're actually for this stuff, and I can actually talk about it freely and talk about things. So I wanted to share a real quick story about the training I went to that the Culture Project put on. To get their new speakers, their missionaries that are out in the field, they're, they're self supported missionaries. They go raise money so they can go talk about this stuff to high school kids in a way that the high school kid can accept. So I said, if I'm going to donate to this cause, Christina, how, you got to give me something to show me what you're really doing. I want, I, I need some teeth in this whole thing to know what you're doing. Well, you know, Ralph, we're going to actually have that our speakers training the line. We're going to have uh, a talk. It's the first talk one of our. Speak, male speakers is doing on sexual integrity. This gentleman Dean is going to be up in front of a bunch of kids in Long Island. I'm like, Long Island, that's like the belly of the beast. Like, how are you going to talk to a bunch of six, seven, eight, three kids up in Long Island? Rough culture. And they're all fooling around. And I show up at this school, the kids are up to anxious. And there's always some wise out kid, like, oh, you know, like making comments. And poor Dean's trying to get his talk going. He's talking about living this life of greatness. And he wants to be the best in and the kids start slowing down a little bit, but he keeps going on this thread of, I want to be great. I don't want to just be any God. I want to be a man of greatness. And he gives the story. He goes on, and they're slowly settling down because he's talking about his personal life. He's talking about how sexual integrity made him feel great. Made him feel good. All of a sudden, this, this was exciting. I want to be the best man I can be. I want to love women mightily and rightly and, and just be sacrificial. And, and he gives us an example of how when he finally got to have courage to live this out, he's on this date, and he said goodbye to the girl out the door, and they had a great night, and she goes, you know what? Do you want to come in and watch a movie? And he knew in that moment, he had a choice. And, he said, and all of a sudden, all the craziness of the kids, it was about half an hour, maybe 40 minutes into the talk, you could hear a pin drop in the room. And the girl's like, well, aren't you going to come in? He goes, you know what? I need I need to go. I need to leave. I care about you. And I care about you that much that I'm going to have to go home. I'm going to have to 
I need that. And he goes, and he's got these insecurities. Oh, is she really going to like me? What is she thinking? He's admitting all this. These kids are glued to this guy. They can't believe he's saying this because it resonates in each one of us. Man's hearts. We know it. We're meant to love it. We're all watching. New Yorkers. <laughs> <laughs> and he's telling his insecurities how bad he felt the next day. He goes, he tells you what he's with these guys. Even the fathers are there, like, they told <laughs> And he says that the girl gave a call the next day. And she said, Ian, I have to thank you. No man has ever loved me like that before. Ever. Thank you for loving me. And those kids, from that point on, that night, it was, it, it, it was a game changer. After the talk, these kids are coming up, the rambunctious kids are coming up saying, when I graduate from college, how can I do this? How can I be a missionary with this? How can I get involved? Where do I, where do I go? Well, you know, and they're asking, then we have a question and answer session afterwards. They're talking about things like, so when you went to confession, it was being able to share how confession was so important. Talk about pornography. I was like, well, what did the priest say? It's just a really trick. What, did, what was it like? Do you still get it? You know, those thoughts sometimes. And so the kids are being so transparent, and Dean's giving the real stuff like, we never escape this temptation. However, like Chris was saying, these rocket engines were meant to shoot us in the stars. And these kids started to see it. They started to believe it to the point where we had proof. We knew it worked. Like, I knew as a fellow donor, this message works. It sells, it's needed. I would never have left the Catholic Church as a kid. A young adult life, if I knew that the Catholic Church was this excited about this stuff. So fortunately, I heard Chris West back in like 1999, and it was like, he's sitting on this dream, like, I gotta find out more about the Catholic Church. Why the papacy? Why the Eucharist? Why confession? If they, if they think this much about sex and marriage, they must mean something more on celibacy and <laughs> contraception and all that stuff. There's gotta be something more. And I kept getting my answers, and eventually in 2009, yeah, nine years, I came back to the Catholic faith. This is the most incredible evangelistic tool a Catholic could ever have to know these teachings, to understand them better, to talk about it, dialogue about it, it's okay to talk about it. And it's going to bring our, our world, our country, our world back to the faith. I encourage you to do it in one way to just participate. If you've enjoyed the last couple of weeks, if this has meant anything to you, even just, you know, the price of a couple Starbucks coffees, like 10 bucks, 25 bucks a month, you know what it does for this organization? It gives them confidence. It gives them peace to know we can count on that revenue. We know that it's going to be there. We can count on that monthly donor. It might not seem like that to you, but I encourage you to take one of these. If you don't want to feel that tonight, take it home. Remember how important this night was, how great Christopher was, how this whole season of, of teachings here has been so awesome. And pray about it. Think about it. I would never want to. I'm in sales. I would never want to make someone feel obligated to do something. So I, I get that vibe. But this... This message I'm telling you, it works. And so I just encourage you all, and I can't thank you enough for letting me talk. Please take this home and prayerfully consider just being a contributor. And may you just richly bless you in life to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. So there are uh, envelopes on everyone's seat. If you do want to go ahead and sign up to be a monthly donor tonight, you can do that. Um, and if, in the case that you do, there's a couple culture project people in the back. Stephanie, can you raise your hand? You can hand her your your envelope. Um, but do do carefully consider because we do need you. The culture project doesn't exist without the support of our community and our friends and family. So thank you again, Rob. So. Everyone, here we are. The end of week six of Love and Responsibility. Um, it's almost 10, so I know we gotta get out of here. I just have a couple of announcements to make. Okay, sorry, you didn't know. Um, don't worry about what time it is. <laughs> uh, just, a, just a couple of words before we wrap up. Um, I hope you've let this series change you. Uh, I know it's changed me, or in Bill's words, I hope we've let this series ruin you a little bit, um, wreck you, tear you apart, inspire you, whatever whatever has happened. I hope that you're letting that happen, um, and that you're entering in, and that you continue to enter in. Um, 
This is the end of this series, uh, but I hope it's not the end of, of what's been built here. Uh, this community, this new journey that some of us have started, maybe a deepening of the journey that some of us are already on. So we hope to have more events like this in the future, so stay tuned. Like I said last week, if you have any ideas of what you would like to see in the future, do let us know. Um, but So the Culture Project isn't going to be planning your Thursday nights anymore. But um, So now this community is on you. It's in your hands. So stay in touch with one another. Get each other's numbers. Keep writing in that Facebook group. Ask that guy or girl out to coffee if you're interested. Because we're not going to be bringing it together anymore. So whatever it is, I just hope that you keep it going. And we keep building and we do this all as a team and as a community. Imagine what Philadelphia could look like if we took this momentum, each of us individually, and ran with it. If we shared it with one person. All of the talks are on Facebook, on the Culture Project's Facebook page. Um, if there's someone that you wish was here and could have heard one of these talks, share it with them. It's free. It's out there. It's a gift. It's meant to be shared and meant to be, meant to be given and heard by everyone. So continue to stay in touch. Um, Stay in touch with the Culture Project. Keep up with what we're doing because we're hoping to have some exciting things on the radar really soon. Although the Culture Project isn't having any, any more, well, we are having more events. One second. We are having our second Sunday after this weekend's Mass. Um, the Archbishop's Mass is at 6.30 p.m. Before the Archbishop's Mass, the Cathedral Young Adult Group is having a, an event. And where is it, when? Cherry Blossom Festival, 1 p.m. at the Horticultural Center. Cherry Blossom Festival, 1 p.m., Horticultural Center. You'll put that on the Facebook page for LNR. Awesome. And then afterwards, come to City Tap House with us and grab a drink, celebrate Sunday. It's Palm Sunday, people, right before Holy Week, before Lent gets more intense. Come join us and have a, have a fun Sunday. Also, CCYA, our bar sponsors for the night, are having an event on April 27, a dinner with the Archbishop. Um, can we have the CCYA people raise your hand? Find out what they've got going on. There are events for all the What's that? It's all online. It's on the walls, in the back, in the ground. Um, but, but, but keep up the momentum. Let's, let's support each other's efforts in building this young adult community. Finally, again, visit the, the TOB table in the back and the core project table and the culture project table. Make sure that you're, you're patronizing all of these wonderful nonprofits. Um, and finally, last but not least, I know it's late. We are going to make shades again after tonight, so hope to see all of you there. I know it's work night, so, but whatever, this is the last one. So if you could go beforehand, if you could just give us a hand cleaning up this room. Another thank you to the seminary, thank you to the arch. Diocese, thank you to CTYA, to Theology of the Body Institute, to everyone that has made these things happen, to our core teams. Can we give a round of applause to the core team that's made this happen? Thank you, everyone who's watching on Facebook Live. Um, do we have a priest in the room that could close us in prayer? Seminarian? Let's say glory be together and call the name. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. So that is the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. St. John Paul II, pray for us. So before we all leave, I don't want to get behind the mic, but um, these weeks would have never happened without Katie Bay, and we just have to go around the phone.
Sarah.